guess this is where I start. So this is um, this is going to be really high level compared to everybody else's talk. So um, hopefully I'm not talking down to everybody, but we'll see how this works out. So this is basically best practices when developing open source tools. Uh, most people here are probably already well aware of this stuff, but we'll get to that in a second. So hi there. This is. I would run over there to that one and that one, but that's a lot of running, so it's me. I'm uh, Jason Van Gumster. I work with Orange Turbine and CG Cookie uh, as a consulting lead and also marketing director. And basically, a lot of the stuff that we do works with integrating Blender into production pipelines, helping toolmakers and studios do that sort of work. And so there's a lot of conversation we end up having about open source and uh, what, can do, what it can do, how do you talk to it. If you're releasing tools, are those tools gotta, do those tools have to be open source? And so these are the sort of conversations that I tend to have. And so I will say the standard disclaimer, not a lawyer, I just happen to talk about this stuff an awful lot and have been around doing it for quite a while. So that's the standard disclaimer. So now I'm safe, right? All right. So Here's, here's the, yeah, don't, don't we already all know this? This is, after all, open source days. Most people here should uh, have at least some minor bit of experience with, with open source stuff. So quick show of hands. How many people here have submitted a patch to an open source project? Most of you, half of you, yeah, all of you, good. How many are releasing your own open source tools and doing that? This is great. So really this talk isn't, just for you, or might not even be for you, but this talk is for, um, you still run into a lot of situations where you have either corporate IT, enterprise systems, or whatever, that you know, they don't necessarily believe the statistic that was in the keynote about uh, 80 to 90% of the internet still you know, actually running Linux and being run on open source. And so you have to give justifications or you have to give explanations about why tools are being open and then, then, then to go into a little bit about how you actually go about doing that. And so this talk is really meant partially as ammunition uh, and a little bit of education for, for providing that kind of information and really being, uh, being useful in that regard. So let's... Let's start with the question is when you're releasing, when you're distributing software, when you're releasing it, what are you selling? What are you giving? Are, the thing is, you're not actually giving away code. You're not giving away ideas, IP as much. You're really providing a promise. That's what you're, that's what you're providing to the world. You're not actually selling software. You're not actually even, if you're doing open source stuff, you're not even giving away software. What you're doing is you're giving away a promise. And the promise really has two parts. It's helpful, and more importantly, you're helpful. What I mean by that is that the tool has to do something, right? It's being beneficial either, you know, in some cases, Everybody else is doing the standard wrong, and you're doing something open source to set the standard so that everybody does it right. Or there's a lot of interoperability you want to do between different studios or different tools. These are the sort of things where it's helpful. But the more important part is that you're helpful, that you're providing support, that you have some level of longevity, that you have the ability to continue that project beyond its own thing. Yeah, it's open source. Anybody can. But that doesn't mean anybody will. And that's why things like the SWF and Linux Foundation and these sort of things are, are particularly helpful. But it's not just having that infrastructure above it. The people who actually make the stuff, you, have to be the one that's helpful, that's providing that support. And that, the promise that you're there to do that, that's really what you're selling. That's really what you're distributing. That's really what you're giving to people, is you're going to help them with the tool itself, and then you're going to help them with the tool. Right, so that if there needs support, needs new features, needs updates, that's what you're doing. And because of that, the promise is more valuable than the IP. That's, that's, a, that's a hard one to say really out loud, actually. <laughs> but the, the, because if you have something that's great, a great tool that does wonderful things, but it's not gonna get support, this is not gonna get new features, that actually isn't going to help in real world cases, then the IP is worthless. It's not doing anything for anybody. The ability to support that, the ability to provide help for that, that's where that is. And that's not just, that that's, depends on also what, what you're working with, right? If you're working with open source libraries, then your support's gonna be a lot more on the developer support. 
course, there's also open source applications, right? Then there's more and more of those that are being worked into this environment as well. And so then you're talking about end user support. Both of those things are kind of the requirements to make sure that that has that longevity and has that way of continuing to work. And so if you're working in an environment where uh, you do run into resistance about maybe I shouldn't be open sourcing this or maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Well, the thing is, does it make things easier and how are we going to continue supporting it and is it going to be, is that, that promise the thing that we're going to keep giving? That's sort of the overall spiel and again, this is open source day so hopefully that's not anything you guys don't already know but I figured I'd throw that in there. So the real thing, this is the large, very simple overview and review that we can blast through hopefully super quick, and that is the how, right? Um, and really, this is the, the mechanics of it, and very simple, there's, there's, there's four steps. Um, four steps. Um, the first one is, is you need to have permission. You can't, you can't make something open source, you can't release something under an open source license unless you actually had the permissions to do that. And this is clearances and these sort of things that you would see in books and media and whatever. Those sort of same things still apply here. And again, this is, this is having that permission is kind of critical. And it's, this is actually, I'll say, more important than, oh, well, our code is dirty or no one else can mess with it or, or we don't understand where everything's going or it's just really badly formatted. That matters a lot less than can we actually do it? Is it linking to libraries that, that we can't share? Is it doing things that, um, that are actually trade secret? Those are the sort of things that need to be discussed and figured out within an organization, or if you're an individual doing research, those are the sort of things that you want to sort of work with and, and make sure that's happening. So you get permission, yay! Hopefully it's in writing, because you know legal things and all that stuff. But then when you're actually doing the release, you also have your license file. And whatever the license happens to be, it could be Apache, it could be MIT, it could be GPL, whatever it happens to be. I'm, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the, the, the battles of which license people are going to use and how permissive they need to be. But you do need to make that publicly available and publicly known what license you're using. And then the one thing that, see, one of the things that working with Orange Turbine. Orange Turbine's part of CG Cookie. CG Cookie's also part of Blender Market. Blender Market sells a lot of Blender add-ons, and Blender add-ons, by default, have to be GPL compliant. So there's a lot of conversation about working with open source tools in that regard. And so one of the other things it needs, license notices. And this is one of those things that does get noticed and uh, does get overlooked quite a bit, because you have these large add-ons, you have these large bit blocks of code that have a lot of different files. And in the case of, the, of Blender work, those are Python files, and they don't get compiled unless you're talking about PyC. Uh, so you, they have to be visible, and you have to have a license notification on the top of every one of them. It's annoying, uh, but fortunately, you can do that with a script. Yay! And then the last part is making the actual code available. This takes a lot of different forms, and you'll see a lot of different people doing it in a lot of different ways, depending on how they interpret whatever license they happen to be using. Um, so, and again, it depends a bit on the license, uh, but the, the baseline is if you give the application, the library, the tool to somebody, they also get the source code to it. That's generally the way that works, at least with, uh, especially with GPL, but even with the other ones, if you're, if you're gonna say it's open source, you might as well provide the source. Now, there's always the corner questions and the whatabouts and how do, I, how do I integrate these other components to it. One of the ones that we run into a lot with uh, Blender add-ons in particular, because Blender, Blender, the way it's set up, Python add-ons for it are, need to all be open source and GPL compatible. However, the assets, anything you create with Blender, models, textures, geometry nodes, as far as we know, um, all of those things don't have to be. Those are those are you know all rights reserved to whoever makes them. So if you're doing an asset pack that has a convenience library that is written as an add-on to control that, uh, how do you how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with things dealing with libraries versus applications? And so one of the things you deal with we deal with a lot is mixed licenses, where you actually have a bundle. And you have, these are all of the models that come with it, and then I have, in the case of Blender, you have some sort of block of code to make it 
accessible. It could be simply, and it doesn't have to be with Blender for that matter, it could be anything that you code that's gonna be a UI for, and any sort of accessibility feature, any sort of thing that isn't just, here's a library of stuff, there's code associated with that. If you're gonna be making that open source, you have to, most open source licenses, most code licenses don't make sense for assets, right? You're not gonna do uh, a 3D model as Apache or MIT or GPL. That's gonna be either a full, like a um, royalty free, could be all rights reserved, could be um, Creative Commons licenses. But those are the licenses that are more appropriate for that kind of media. And you have to be able to provide a clear way of showing that. And the structure typically ends up being Here's the code stuff in this folder, here's the assets in this folder, and then you actually have licensing that are tied to each of those so that it's kind of clear when someone digs into the structure of what's, what belongs to what. It'd be nicer if there was like an interface for that, but then the interface requires, uh, that's basically, you're, you're talking about managing metadata, and there's not actually as many tools available for just the licensing component of that. Um, if, if you guys know of any, let me know. But that's where that lives. The other one, that you run into a lot is the difference between libraries and, and applications, right? So most of the tools talked about at Open Source Days, these are all libraries. And these are things that are underpinning, and a lot of them are gonna be Apache licenses or MIT licenses that don't necessarily have to have additional open sourciness. Open sourciness? Yes, we'll say that. Uh, they don't have to have additional open sourciness tied to it. They're but because they're libraries and they're gonna be underpinning a lot of the technology that we're, we're working with that's gonna be facing actual end users. But you do have other applications. You have things like OpenRV, you have things like Blender, you have things like Gaffer that are actually user facing, that actually have uh, those components to it. And there are different licensing considerations that you wanna take into account for that. And there's, I could talk for hours about that particular component and I don't, I don't encourage you to ask me about that because it's really boring. But um, the, the, the idea here is that it's not, at that point, it's not so much about what license, it's still making sure that you're adhering to that promise of your, then you're not just supporting developers, but you're also supporting the people that are actually, the end users that are actually using that tool. And that's really the, the support question that you're talking about when you start dealing with uh, the, the promise that you're providing with, uh, with your licensing and, and your open source tools. And so that's really a consideration worth, consider well, consideration worth considering when you're uh, putting out a, when you make the decision to say this tool is going to be an open source tool and those sort of things. The other thing is when you make contributions upstream, the, the thing you wanna make sure that you're doing is that's the same, a patch is sort of like a microcosm of the overall sort of thing that you're providing, right? So you're, if you're providing a patch, that patch also has to be useful. And chances are good, you're the one that coded it, so you're the one that should be maintaining it and supporting it, and still you're providing that promise. If somebody, if you're providing that patch and you get a patch review and it says you need to make a modification, you should make a change to it, eh, you know, maybe that, that's, that's part of the support you're providing, you're just because you're trying to push that upstream. And so really the conversation then becomes how much you want to provide in terms of making sure you can adhere to that promise. Um, and so the, the last little bit here is, is really a question of how, how you have a tool and you really want to know whether or not this is something that you're interested in pushing, either pushing upstream as a patch to an existing tool or um, or making it open source overall, right? And that's really, the question then becomes partially one of resources, right? And that, because that conversation always comes up, right? Do we have the resource? And we actually was, Guido was just talking about it, the prioritization because it's something that's being offered for free. But that's where the conversation also should be about the value of the promise versus the IP itself, right? If, if that is, if interoperability just using that example is is a priority. You want to be able to, that you can talk to other. You want to be able to talk to other tools and make sure that they can talk to each other. Then the value of that function, the value of being able to support that, is is quite a bit. And that also uh, sort of factors into the keynote at the beginning where we're talking about the what's the the Kokomo model for the the financial value of that. That's that's 
that's a contribution that one you're helping provide, but that's the one that you're going to be accepting patches and, and being able to support pulling into. And so there's not a clear answer for this. Uh, my, I, I also ha I have my biases. The answer is please do. But that's that's the uh, I think it, those benefits really help in the general case of things. And so really that that's. That's basically the talk that I had at this point, uh, and that's that's what I was going to go with that. I'm Jason. I'm with Orange Turbine. Uh, that's me right there. So yeah, thanks a bunch. <laughs>